Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt Wright, and I'll be hosting the discussion today. Before we get started, again, just some housekeeping. Uh, we plan on uh, to go for around 40 to 45 minutes today. And if you have a question, you can submit via your Zoom uh, portal. Uh, we've had a number of questions already, uh, which is great. And hopefully we can cover a lot of those as we go through today. Also a reminder that CPD points will be available post today's session. Um, so today we are joined by Paul Taylor, Portfolio Manager of the Fidelity Australian Equities Fund. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Matt. Uh, great to be here. Great to, great to be uh, talking. Yeah, great. Uh, a couple of quick points I just want to highlight uh, before we start. Uh, so in June this year, Paul hit the 18 year mark of running the Fidelity Australian Equities Fund, which is a, an outstanding achievement. Uh, and furthermore, over that time period, uh, Paul was able to outperform the index by 233 basis points per annum net of fees, which really is not too many other Australian fund managers that have been able to achieve this over that such long time period. So today, so today we're gonna to talk about everything from COVID to inflation to high bond yields, to uh, uh, reporting season, to portfolio positioning and everything in between. Um, so just to start things off, um, Paul, you've done an exceptional job navigating through big market events like the GFC, and now more recently, obviously COVID over the last year. So it'd be great if you could just paint the picture of what's happened over the last 12 to 14 months and where we are today. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's uh, yeah, it's amazing to look back, isn't it? Really, that that last uh, little over a year has been quite an incredible, quite an incredible period. Uh, and I think, I think the interesting thing to place to start at is if we go back to early 2020, I, I, I guess most people would say the actual impact of COVID on people's lives and the way they operate and um, has probably and and the and the duration has probably been much worse than expected but um the impact on markets on the economy uh actually the economy and the markets have probably been much better than expected which i think is a really interesting sort of dichotomy and if we look at that period we you know going into end of march 2020 the market dropped i think about 35 odd percent uh, which puts it into one of the major market downturns in Australia's history, although um, nowhere near the GFC, which was over 50% as, as well as that, that in 1929. Uh, and we pretty much regained all of that over the last 12 months. So when we do look at all the major market declines, uh, this is one of the quickest rebounds. And, and once again, uh, early on in the piece, uh, you know, the questions were, is this a, uh, V-shaped recovery, is this a W-shaped recovery, is this a Z, is this a T, is this an N, is this an L, which was the, obviously the worst scenario of all. Um, so I think now with our hindsight, we can see very clearly it's a very, very sharp V. Uh, and we have had, it's been one of the quickest recoveries through that period. Um, I think also early on, and I, I've touched on this on a, pre, a few of my previous, um, from the desk of uh sort of newsletters or or previous zoom or video um videos on the website you know right at the start of any sort of crisis whatever it is uh you'd have this sort of trade-off between judgment and data and information and right at the start you really we really didn't have a lot of information on on COVID-19 I mean we we had a little bit through things like the previous SARS and swine flu impact from swine flu etc but we, we really didn't have a lot of data. So really in that situation, you've got to use a lot of judgment. So it's almost 100% judgment. But over that year, uh, over the last year, we've really learned a lot. We've got a lot more data, a lot more information and can make a lot more sort of informed decisions. But right at the start, it is all about judgment. And that judgment really is based on, um, I guess, historical um, crises and and uh, one of the things I, I I have talked about previously as well is that uh, you know I've been at Fidelity I mean, as you said I've been running the fund now for almost eighteen years from inception and and been at Fidelity for um, twenty four years 
And over that 24 years, I think I added up that I've been through about 10 different crises. So I guess the first point is the crises seem to come along a lot much more frequently than you really think. Um, they, you know, that's one almost every two or three years. You know, uh, we seem to have 100 year events every two or three years, which is, um, you know, I think it's interesting in its, in its own right. But you do learn a lot through those different crises. Um, and, and early on, you, you use heuristics or, or rules of thumb. Uh, and one of the best rules of thumb for markets in any sort of crisis is this second derivative. So whatever's causing the crisis, uh, second derivative is really acceleration or deceleration. So when you get a change in that acceleration or deceleration, that's often the point of maximum pain. So as we saw for new cases in Australia, they were accelerating um, and then basically started to flatten at the end of March and it, almost to the day that was the bottom of the market. And I think it's, I think it links that way because it's just the point that when that acceleration changes, it's the point of maximum pain. It's, it's when governments are doing the most, taking the most action, people, um, general community, maybe the panic is the highest um, and uh, a very bad scenario sort of um, gets factored into markets. And that's exactly, and that's exactly what happened. And, and um, as everybody knows, markets also uh, don't reflect what's happening at the moment. They reflect what's going to happen in one or two years' time. So the markets are a forward-looking um, sort of mechanisms as well. So pretty much from that late March, uh, we saw the market bottom, and you know we pretty much recovered it to today. Uh, the big issues have been, um, you know, and, and a big part of that recovery, I, I guess the the government. Um, narrative at the time was that COVID is a one-off. It's, it, it's uh, you know, by, by its nature, it's, it's one-off. Uh, and it's like this giant ravine. And we have to get to the other side of that. We have to sort of get keep the economy going till we get to the other side of it. And some of the analogies that the government's used, which probably two main, the two main ones were, you know, hibernation. So let's just keep businesses hibernating until we get to the other side. Or the other one was sort of build a bridge over that giant ravine. And I think broadly they've been very successful in the way that they've done that. So uh, we already had relatively low interest rates, but um, interest rates did go down through that period. So we've had a you know, really strong monetary stimulus, um, although I think a lot of the heavy lifting this time has really been done by fiscal policy. So we've had, as well as, um, you know, we're now effectively zero interest rates well, it's very stimulatory monetary environment. We've had a very stimulatory fiscal environment and governments have um, you know, got a lot of money into the economy, into the communities, et cetera. Um, and I guess it's probably reasonably reasonable to define those as, as really helicopter money. So Australia went, had, this, had a furlough program, which is really just trying to keep people in jobs. So the job keeper uh, and actually put out a lot of money in, into the economy um, broadly, that's been successful. So, I, you know, when you look at the economy, the Australian economy, um, while we went into a recession in 2020 and, and uh, GDP declined, we're seeing very strong, a very strong rebound in, in 2021. And, and um, depending upon your source, probably five or six percent GDP growth uh, this year, uh, which is a really strong outcome. We've also seen unemployment while it also it ticked up. So. Pre-COVID unemployment was around sort of 5.1, ticked up to about six and a half percent through COVID. Although that a lot of people argue that if you if you have the sort of you know that got kept low because of JobKeeper and the furlough program, maybe a shadow unemployment um, might have been closer to a couple of percent above that. But even now, uh, and we're past you know we uh, JobKeeper is no longer with us. Um, you know, unemployment's already back to five and a half percent and heading towards five percent uh, over the next 12 months. So very strong um, uh, employment growth, uh, very strong uh, economy and really that um, those tailwinds of monetary and fiscal policy has really supported us through the, the difficult position. Now, like I said, we've got a lot more data now. We've got a lot more information on COVID and the impacts and how we should treat it. And we, we understand it a lot better now than we did uh, 
12 months ago, but there's still a range of unanswered questions. We're getting better at sort of trying to either through the lockdowns or through um, uh, better practices. Um, uh, we're getting much better at it, but still, there's still a range of uncertainties. The, the domestic economies look like they're sort of coming back to life and there's reasonable growth, um, you know, international travel, and that's still, still a little way off and, and uncertainty around when that's going to come, when that will come back fully. But um, I think a pretty strong result nonetheless, and, and one I think people broadly are, you know, pr pretty happy with. So, yeah, really interesting year. Um, we've learned a lot and it's actually, um, uh, you know, has, you know, had a big impact on people's lives and, and, um, and communities, but, uh, from an economic and, and economic perspective and a, and a market perspective, it's actually been probably a lot better than, than anticipated. Yeah. Great, Paul. Thanks for that. Um, so I, I guess kind of dovetailing into that if we could just talk around obviously the rba and central banks their focus at the moment is obviously what happens with inflation and gdp growth uh particularly you know moving forward in the next two three five years time so just want to get your comments around that and, and kind of where you think inflation and gdp growth is going moving forward yeah, look, I think that's that's really the question. That's an important part of both. There's, you know, there's two big issues impacting markets at the moment. One is, uh, you know, COVID recovery. So um, we're seeing that be reflected. As I said, the market is already back to where, effectively back to where it was pre-COVID. So, um, you know, strong recovery is already factored in. Uh, but the second part of it is now because of the strength of the economy, there's a belief that inflation is, is going to start coming in and higher interest rates are going to start coming in. And, and um, they obviously have consequences on individual stocks as, as well as the market. But if we sort of take a step back from all of that, um, it, it, we, the central banks, so if we start with the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Reserve Bank of Australia, you know, we are effectively, it's, you know, 0.1%, effectively 0% interest rates. And the RBA basically said that they don't think they're going to have to um, touch rates for three years or not significantly increase them for three years. So we not until 2024. Now, that's a reasonable uh, that's a reasonable way out that they think we're still going to be in a very low uh, rate environment. Uh, and if you I think if you that gets that, that that sort of sentiment gets reflected in central banks right around the world and and. Um, uh, so a lot of them, they don't feel like they're going to be pressured to take rates up, uh, you know, not six months, not 12 months, but, uh, you know, like I said, sort of like they, they're looking at about three years. I think they, they think there has been a lot of demand destruction through COVID-19. So this big, ravine, this big ravine that we're in, there has been a lot of demand destruction. And there's actually needs to be a lot of growth just to recover a lot of that um, demand, uh, demand destruction. Uh, so, um, you know, that in, inflation could be a way off. Now, we're growing that strongly. Now, they've also said that they're, they're waiting for sort of real um, way, significant wage growth before they, um, and they think that's sort of, as I said, they think that's sort of three years out. I think the other thing um, with interest rates and inflation, the other thing they're sort of, um, I guess, signalling is, even if, even if inflation is a little bit higher, um, they're, they're probably accommodative of that. So I think they're, they're, they're very keen to see growth resume in economies. They want that for, for employment. They want that to sort of normalise economies. Um, and they're, they're probably willing to put up with a little, you know, not, not out of control, but probably a little bit higher um inflation to get that growth and i think also um you know so one of the issues around i guess at least the helicopter money but the, but but broader the big fiscal stimulus has been that uh government debt has significantly increased now australia is not in a bad position so you know so pre-covid our you know government debt's very low our corporate debt's very low the debt in australia is held at the household level 
but because of the fiscal stimulus, I guess the government debt's increased. It's still in a reasonable spot. It's not um, uh, completely outrageous and it's very manageable at this sort of level as well. Um, so Australia is still very fortunate, I guess, against a lot of countries in the world and, and against our own against our own history. But you know, one of the things I think um, authorities also look at is that, and this this sort of equation of you want you now you want growth to be higher, G to be higher than I, so growth to be higher than than interest rates. And if that happens, it's almost a natural pay down of the debt, which obviously helps with the government. Um, but uh, budget and balance sheet, et cetera, as well. So what, what I mean by that is, um, so if GDP is growing at some higher rate, so if GDP, you know, like I said, we're potentially looking at five and maybe slightly higher percent in 2021. If, if growth is at 5%, but interest rates are at 1%, what it means is that the economy is growing at 5%. And if you assume the government take is the same percentage of the GDP, so you don't get major changes in tax policy. It will mean that the tax take by government in an absolute terms should grow 5%. Now, um, so that your, your intake is growing much faster, faster than one of your big costs, which is obviously the, well, not a big cost, but um, the, the, the interest cost, um, it's gonna be outgrowing the interest cost. So naturally you're gonna be paying down you're going to be paying down the debt. So it's a very natural way to sort of repair your balance sheet. But you need growth to be much higher and, and interest to, interest rate to be still lower. And I think that's part of, also part of the reason why uh, maybe they're happy, uh, even if there's a little bit of inflation, um, they're happy to sort of let that happen because it's much more important to keep the growth going. So um, I think that's how government's going to look at it. I, I, I guess the other issue, you know, we're at, we're fundamentally at zero interest rates. So I think it's, I think it's fair to say interest rates are going up. Uh, and I don't think that's really the question. I think the question is interest rates, are, well, interest rates are going up, but the question is, you know, are they going up in six months? Are they going up in a year? Or are they going up in three years or five years? And I guess I'm, I'd be much more in the camp that it's, you know, a lot, because I think what the central banks are saying is very, you know, is a sensible approach to all of this. And I think, um, you know, it's much more uh, aligned to that sort of three, three year view that we'll start to see them coming, coming through. So it's, it's still probably lower, uh, lower for longer. Um, I think there is some, I think the other thing to note is there is some, um, sort of inflation in the system right now and, and people will see it but it's um, it's actually more to do with supply side than it is to do with the, the demand side so demand is improving because we, we you know we're, we're in this sort of COVID recovery but we still got some supply side issues so for instance I guess on, a, on certain industries you've got some wage pressure because uh, historically and, you know, I think people known from my previous presentations, you know, Australia has been the best performing stock market in the world over the long term. And a big part of that reason has been strong population growth that Australia has achieved. Now, um, we need that population growth. That population growth drives um, employment growth, uh, but it obviously helps meet certain labour demands. So you can see it already in the economy as you know, whether it's the hospitality, entertainment, uh, food and beverage um, sectors are coming back to life. A, a lot of the time they were very reliant on uh, international labour or people coming in and, and, you know, maybe being a little bit more transient. They were very reliant on that. Now, as obviously um, we're not getting the international sort of people in, uh, that's put a real. That's there's a real pressure point in terms of weight in that particular sector, wages, etc. We're also seeing um, inflation come through on a range of building products, building materials, building products, whether that might be steel or um, uh, concrete, etc. Now, once again, that's a bit short term because it's very much that's a logistical issue. So we just can't get the product. And also, people talk about. Um, you know, difficult of getting cars or secondhand cars or new cars, just getting getting that, getting them into the market. There's logistical issues. So the demand is improving, but the supply can't respond for those very specific COVID reasons. Now, um, like I said, while I think 
you know, interest rates and inflation will go up from here. We're, we're at very low levels. I actually think it's still a bit further out. But it's not going to be a straight line. I think you're going to see this sort of um, shark tooth type approach. So at the moment, you're getting a little bit of inflation coming in, but they're COVID re- supply, COVID related supply constraints. Now, if um, we're able to get into a, a sort of a full recovery from COVID, you'll actually see those logistical bottlenecks and you'll see those labor bottlenecks go away. So that actually be inflate, that'll be a reliever to inflation. You actually, you'll, you'll then see inflation coming back down. So um, like I said, it's going up in the long term, but I think you're going to see a bit more of a shark tooth type approach uh, in the short term. I think the other thing is um, authorities have probably learnt from um, the issues they had in 2016, or there's a few different lessons. So if people remember back to 2016, interest rates, inflation were very low. Um, then there was, okay, we bottomed, we're going up, we're getting global growth, um, inflation is going to come into the market. And uh, the Fed in the US, central bank in the US, started to take interest rates up um, and stop quantitative easing. And basically they did that, um, it was, it, well, I guess it was quick, but it wasn't hugely quick. Uh, interest rates went up, uh, the market got spooked, and then straight away um, the Fed dropped its interest rate. So it gave up, gave up very, very quickly. And uh, there's a few different things. I think they've sort of learned that necessarily austerity doesn't really work when you're trying to get, when you're trying to get growth going you don't want to bring austerity in too quickly um, and you don't want to take interest rates up too quickly because it'll put a, it'll put a gra- cap on growth very, very quickly. Um, you really want to um, sort of extend it out. And that's why I think the central banks are sort of saying, well, you know, nothing for three years is they want to extend, they want to get the growth going. They don't want to cap it. They don't want to um, stop it very quickly. And they've, they've learned from their mistakes uh, back in back in 2016, they've learned that austerity is probably not the right approach when you're trying to get things going again, and um, also you probably don't you you we, you don't want to put interest rate rates up too quickly. That's also a big mistake. Um, and like I said, specifically in this environment where you've got a lot of demand destruction, they want that growth to. Um, there's a lot of growth that needs to happen just to get over the demand destruction. So, um, yes interest rates inflation is going up from here but i it's a to me it's a three-year issue not a not a six-month issue and uh central banks governments have learned from their mis- previous mistakes of you know bringing in austerity too quickly increasing interest rates too quickly and and you saw what happened in 2016 they had to they had to give up on that um give up on that uh, very very quickly so i sort of see the tailwinds of monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus hanging around for, you know, hanging around for a reasonable amount of time. Now, um, that monetary, you know, to me, that's a very clear path. Fiscal is an interesting one as well. So fiscal, we had, you know, through the last year and early this year, it's really been help, what you call helicopter money, which is the furlough scheme of um, job keeper. Um, and it's basically just getting money out as quickly as possible to people, and then they're out spending, which is which is driving the growth in the economy. But you know, the government's already stopped JobKeeper end of last month, um, and I just think there's, and you can already already see they're trying to be a little bit more targeted with their fiscal stimulus. So it's very focused on certain industries and sectors that are that re- probably haven't recovered due to s- special circumstances. Um, so they're very targeted on certain industries. The other thing I think you'll see is probably a move away from helicopter money, just getting it out to everybody to be to more targeted industries, but then also probably much more focused on infrastructure. So to me, the infrastructure is a great one because it still gets money out into the economy, still grows the economy. But, um, you know, their nation building, we've got so many nation building projects we could be undertaking. And that's a much better outcome than obviously just... Um, dropping money from helicopters so uh fiscal monetary st- stimulus still with us for for th- another three years or so and um fiscal stimulus is going to be with us although it's being um 
you know, maybe shepherded in a, in a slightly different direction, away from helicopter money towards infrastructure and much more towards targeted sectors and industries. Great, thanks, Paul. You've covered off a lot of stuff there, which was um, which is great. Um, and obviously, you know, talking around, um, you know, JobKeeper rolling off, monetary and fiscal stimulus, uh, inflation, growth. Uh, maybe if you can just touch on a little bit around uh, reporting season in, in Feb and then how you've kind of changed the portfolio um, moving forward. Yeah, so it was actually a really good reporting season. Um, we have had not just reporting season, but we've had, um, I think, seven, now seven months in a row um, of, uh, of, of earnings upgrades, which is a quite a little bit unusual. There's a there's a sort of a market saying that, um, you know, sell in May and go away. And there is a little bit of nervousness as we head into May as well. But um, when, and basically what that, the, 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 how that saying's come about is that typically what happens is you start the year in January with really optimistic outlook and the world's great and blah, blah, blah. Um, but then slowly through the year, you get, you, you become real, you know, your, real, your estimates get readjusted to reality. And by May, um, you start to see some of the downgrades come in. But like I said, the last seven months, we've seen upgrades. So we've seen uh, the economy being much better than expected because of the uh, fiscal and, and monetary stimulus. So we've seen upgrades coming through. And if I just look at where the, mar the overall Aussie market is now, we're, you know, we've, we're on about a 19 times price earnings ratio, which is a little bit higher than expected, but, but reasonable given where we are with interest rates. Uh, then we're still expecting greater than 20% earnings growth. So that's a really strong, and like I said, we've had upgrades into that, not, not downgrades. That's a really um, uh, you know, strong, uh, strong outcome for, for, for companies and earnings. Um, I think as the year's gone on, uh, so if, if I go back to uh, March 2020, as we went in, into that, once again, people... Uh, we'll hopefully remember from the calls around that time and, and the, um, the newsletters I put out, uh, uh, there's probably th three or four key areas that we were, have been focused in. And I guess when I look at the portfolio, I always talk about an evolution rather than a revolution. So we've continued to add to a range of those different sectors. Probably the cheapest sector was the resources sector. Um, and it's been one of the best performing. So once again, at that time, there was a simple sort of uh, belief that China was the first in and would be the first out. So that, that, that uh, commodities would be a key beneficiary of China, obviously, driving its economy and stimulating its economy. And we've seen that. And we, we've had a, and also a few unusual things happen as well. So on the iron ore side, there's very strong demand uh, from China but supply has been constrained as well. So Australia's key competitor is Brazil. Brazil has been particularly hard hit by COVID and haven't been able to get the supply out to China. And on top of that, they've had some of their supply, they've had a range of, um, you know, tailings dam collapses and, and issues around that and, and governments closing some mines because they really weren't up to scratch. So you've had a range of supply disruptions out of Brazil um, due to, safety and uh, COVID. Uh, so, we, and that, that, that weak supply sort of continues and the strong demand continues. So we've seen over last year uh, in the middle, all through COVID, the price of iron ore, um, you know, really take off and now be very, you know, we're up, up sort of above $170, which is a, which is a phenomenal um, result. Um, so resources has been a good, and we've added to that through the period, you know, uh, some of our bigger names would include companies like BHP, Mineral Resources, uh, Independence Group, um, uh, which we think are you know aligned to that strong commodity to commodity growth, and we we continue to hold those names. Um, the other areas we did, you know, the interesting thing I think through the whole COVID is that with those very strong trends that were happening pre-COVID. COVID didn't really change trends. It seemed to, what it did was accelerate them. Uh, and when we come out the other side, we still think a lot of those trends are going to continue. So one of the obvious ones, e-commerce, that was already happening pre-COVID, got accelerated through COVID. And, um, you know, we still think that's going to be a key, key trend 
post COVID, and that there's a lot of businesses benefiting from that. But there's also a few that are being hard hit by that move away from bricks and mortar towards towards e-commerce. Uh, digital delivery of food and beverage trend pre-COVID got accelerated through COVID, and we still think. Um, th and they're also, I guess, those sort of trends are habits that people get into, and then once they're happy with that habit, they just keep going. Um, uh, digital delivery of food and beverage, e-commerce, um, work from home. Uh, now, even a work from home, while people will start coming back into the office, and you know, I, I know even um, businesses we talk to, I think people want to be in the office. They want to learn from their colleagues. They want to have time with their colleagues. They want to. They want to, you know, discuss a lot of issues. But they have loved the flexibility of working from home. And so I think that um, even once we normalise a bit more, um, we, you know, people will still want to embrace that, uh, that sort of at least a couple of days working from home if they can, if they're in position, job specific positions that can do that. Um, cashless society, another, another big trend pre-COVID, you know, that was a structural uh, cash, it was a structural decline pre-COVID, got accelerated through COVID. So ATM usage just collapsed through COVID. And we still, you know, we, we're still very much on a trajectory to, for a cashless society um, post-COVID. So, you know, playing a lot of those that thematic through that period has been um, very helpful for us. So company, you know, companies like uh, Goodman Group, which is industrial property, uh, strong beneficiary of e-commerce because that's you know people have um, you know you basically need the sheds etc in an e-commerce world. Uh, Goodman Group industrial property has come down um, on cap rates, so increased in value. Uh, and uh, you know Goodman Group is probably the best uh, industrial property developer um, owner in the world, and they've continued to be a, hot, a, a key holding for us for that period. Domino is another key beneficiary of the digital delivery of food and beverage that's been growing very, very strongly. Um, uh, and, you know, they, they've done incredibly well pre-COVID, through COVID and, and post-COVID. Um, and then the, the third area probably is those businesses that are much more right at the coalface of uh, some of the COVID issues, but you obviously need to be the most careful with this sort of group. And we're very, you need to be very focused on balance sheets. So, you know, you basically, if the company's been really hard hit, um, you need to um, obviously make sure they've got the money to get to the other side. So, um, you know, then they need to be there to, 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 get, the, to get the recovery. Uh, and for us, that's, um, you know, so we, we're looking for balance and opt, opt, Often through COVID, the opportunity came up through rights issues or through placements where we could put more money to it in that company at a better price, repair the balance sheet. So it was a it was a bit of a win win um, win win sort of scenario. Uh, and they'd be companies like I mean, interesting one is um, Ramsey Healthcare. And people don't often think in this sort of term. You know, people think about travel and airlines and entertainment and um, hospitality. But you know, hospitals got very hard hit through through COVID because you know elective surgeries had to end. You know, weren't didn't move forward, uh, and then they set up agreements with the states to really not make profit through that period as well. So, um, you know, if you look at what you know, to me, you can put off elective, you can put off a knee operation, you can you cannot do it. You can put it off for six months. You can't put it off for two years. So to me, it's almost a guaranteed demand recovery um, and for a great quality company like Ramsey Healthcare, which is still well below its sort of pre-COVID levels, um, you've got a good sort of recovery trade and, and a much, and a stronger balance sheet because they raise money through the, through the process. Um, they're very attractive sort of re re recovery plays. Um, we've all, you know, also companies like, uh, you know, Hello World, uh, which is a travel agent, which has really been hard hit. Uh, now, whether they come back in, you know, a year or two, you know, it could be, it could be further out, but the one, the share price is well below what it was pre-COVID. Uh, they're not really making money, but they're not burning money, which is the key thing. And they've got a really strong balance sheet. So, you know, even if it's an, even if 
they don't fully recover for another couple of years, they're in a really strong position for when that recovery comes. Um, also, sort of recovery plays like Ardent, which own uh, Dreamworld, very valuable land that, that Dreamworld's on. Uh, main event, which is their U US business, is seeing a good improvement. They brought Redbird into that, very good operators, um, and you know, performance continues to improve. So you've got very good recovery plays. Um, like I said, need to be focused on the balance sheet. I guess the other thing is, as I said right at the start, you know, it's a V-shaped recovery. And if you look at the markets, we're almost, we're pretty much back to where we were pre-COVID. Um, so a lot's getting factored in. But what I've tried to highlight that, I just think if you look below the surface, things are not quite the same. So you've got, and I guess things like Qantas are seen as the, um, the ultimate recovery play. But, you know, the Qantas share price is, is, is almost back to where it was at points in, in 2019, not back to its peak, but at points. So I mean, a lot's already getting factored into what are seen, what are the, I guess, poster child's poster children of, of the recovery. Um, and I just think you need to look, you know, things like um, Ramsey, as I said, Ramsey, Hello World, Arden are well below where they were pre-COVID. So the recovery hasn't really been fully factored into those stocks. So there's probably just better opportunities in a, in a few of those names. Um, so we're looking at that sort of, yeah, so they're probably the three areas we focused on, resources, some of those longer term trends that have accelerated through COVID that's going to continue post COVID and, um, you know, the, the industries that have been hard hit, hard hit by COVID, but haven't yet seen the full recovery from COVID. Yeah, great, Paul. That, that was um, that was fantastic. I, I guess one of the questions that keeps popping up with um, some of the advisors that are asking is around the buy now, pay later sector. Um, so if you can touch on that, obviously there's a lot of overexcitement in that area. Um, CBA with Klarna and obviously launching their own product and PayPal as well. Uh, be good to get your thoughts and comments around the sector and specifically, obviously, after pay. Um. Yeah, so we, we don't, um, I guess the starting point is we don't own Afterpay. We don't own anything within that space. We obviously own financial. So the, the big ownership stocks that we own in the financial sector, Commonwealth Bank, Suncorp and Macquarie Bank, which well, I didn't touch it on before, but we think they're all key beneficiaries of this um, steepening yield curve argument as well. Um, and we, we added to those through, uh, through, the, through the last year as well. Um, the, you know, I, I guess when Afterpay got to nine dollars, um, I sort of kicked myself for not buying it. Went from nine to to uh, one hundred and fifty or whatever. Uh, and I guess what kept there, there's probably a couple of things that kept this out, and I, I probably still keep this out today. I mean, it's come back a little bit, but not but not a lot. Um, so the, I guess the, I mean it's a fantastic. Obviously, the industry has been a great invention, um, especially sort of millennials love it. And it, there's a real fashion to it. And uh, retailers like it because it drives sales growth as well. So the number of people that, that buy things and, and do it um, via Afterpay has really grown as a, as, as a penetration. So it's, it's a, from, a, from a customer perspective and a demand perspective, it's been a, it's been a real success story. Um, but the two, the, the big issues around it, one are, um, we really don't, we haven't had a credit cycle in this space yet. So we don't really know if things get bad or ugly, how, um, sorry, I'm about to sneeze, but I think I've just fought it off. Um, we don't know how bad it could, how, how much, you know, whether there'll be huge write-offs um, if, if things got bad. I think we sort of probably moved away from that now. So we're in a much better position on that than we were back then. But, but the real overhang is things like um, uh, regulation. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of their sort of key competitors, you know, to, to have in this environment for a business, and they don't do any credit checks or anything. Um, well, while regulation is so tight on other sort of subsectors within financials, uh, and very sort of much protecting the consumer and to have this one space that is completely unregulated and, and 
there's no protection for consumers seems a seems a real anomaly and i i just think it's that's just a matter of time before regulation has to come into that space and that and once regulation comes into it it completely changes uh the the, the proposition i think the other um sort of overhang i guess is um it's 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 obviously been a very attractive space and one that's worked so what that does is that that brings in um that brings in competitors and we're going to see more and more of that um i always think it's interesting you can have a very fast growing industry but and now I, I always talk about telcos within this space so you know that if you look at the last decade one of the fastest growing areas is, is telecommunications and data um you just look at what, how everybody's moved online and and what's getting done over online but telcos haven't made it you know they haven't really made any money and and um they haven't really improved over the last decade really because of um because it's commoditized so it's been very fast growth but it's commoditized as everybody as a whole lot of competitors have come into the space or it's a more level playing field and I, I sort of think that that could happen within uh, the buy now pay later space as well, where you get a lot more competitors come in and more aggressively compete for that business because it's such a good business, which means that it commoditizes the product. Now, just one example of that is, um, and you said, you know, Commonwealth Bank are entering entering the space or for one of their product or through through a startup business. And one of the things that they're offering in that startup business is to do it with no no merchant fee. Now, um, Afterpay have a very big merchant fee on it, um, and you know at the moment merchants are happy because it, there's a big uplift in sales, so they're happy. You know they don't, they don't complain about the merchant fee. But if competitors start to come in and say, right, well we're prepared to do the same thing, but have no merchant fee, that's all of a sudden that's starting to commoditize that business starting to bring down returns of that business and just be a much more competitive business and and for the merchants it puts them for consumers and merchants it puts them in a much better position so the merchant can now say to afterpay well either get rid of the merchant fee or we'll go over to this other competitor um and afterpay you've got a choice they can either get rid of the merchant fee uh and um just do things on a much lower return basis or they can not do it and but then potentially lose the client lose the merchant which then will lose the customer as well so um we just think there's going to be the two big things is there's going to be a lot more competition in this space a lot more a high risk that the bit that the industry will get commoditized even it could still continue to grow very rapidly uh for the next five years but um returns are going to go down because of that competition and then also, which is which is probably even the bigger issue, is that um, I just I can't see this sector being the anomaly that doesn't get regulated um, when everything else in financial services is so heavily regulated. Um, and the bigger it gets, the more it attracts the regulators' eye as well. Thanks, Paul. Um, look, we've only got about a minute and a half left. I wanted to quickly ask you one last question. If you've got, you might have to answer it in uh, forty-five seconds, though. So. I hope you got 45 seconds to answer this question. It's, it's obviously a question that's come through a couple of times now. It's just around the iron ore price. And do, you, do you see the current price as being at the extreme point or where do you kind of see that, that, that moving from now? Well, we're, we're definitely up there. Um, I think when we look at the previous cycle, what people call the super cycle, we went, we went through $200. So we're up in the sort of $220, $230 range. Um, and what tends to happen with it is that you do get these sort of pinch points, which then spike it up. But then eventually supply, a supply will come on and match it. And, and, and a lot of high, what tends to be is high cost. You know, um, BHP and Rio are the low cost producers in the world. But there's a lot of high cost production of iron ore that can come on if people think two hundred dollars is going to be sustainable for for the long term. So supply will eventually come on. Um, I think with iron ore though, you, we're still in a very positive environment because um, I think most people still think well, it's one hundred and seventy. But long run prices are maybe closer to eighty dollars a ton. Right. So when you look at most estimates and markets, people are projecting eighty dollars a ton. Um, but then, you know, there might be a few years out, but they're projecting it to come back to $80 a ton. Then I always talk about effectively what happens then is you've got to beat the fade. So 
And this is exactly what's happened with iron ore. It's just stayed, it, not, it doesn't even have to go up. It's just got to stay higher for longer and you're going to get big upgrades in the companies um, because, uh, because, you know, the market's saying it's 170 is going to go to 80. If it can just stay a little bit higher, it beats the fade and you get earnings, you get earnings upgrade. So and I think that's more a realistic scenario than saying, well, we're going to go from 100 to 200. But like I said, you don't, to get, um, to get strong performance, you don't need the iron ore price to go from 170 to uh, 200. You probably just need it to stay uh, above 100 you know, for a prolonged period. And that will actually uh, deliver really strong cash flows. And often that's almost better. Um, and also it encourages, like I said, it, it, it encourages supply to come on. The more higher it is, it just encourages new supply to come on. So um, I think they can be good investments, even if the iron ore price comes back a little bit. Yep. Perfect, Paul. That was more than 45 seconds, but I'll let you get away with that. Uh, we might just wrap things up there. Uh, Paul, thank you again for all your great insights and for continuing to manage the, uh, the fun, the way that you've done for obviously nearly 18 years now. So, and thank you everyone on the call, um, especially for your questions as well. It's been great. Uh, again, CPD points, they'll be sent out within the next two weeks. And please do not hesitate to contact your Fidelity sales manager if you have any further questions. Uh, on that note, thank you very much and have a great afternoon.